It is often said that the revelation of the Quran is easy to explain, simple. The Quran is the verbatim word of God, that is, God spoke the very Arabic words that we hear when the Quran is recited. In fact, we're going to discover in this episode that Islamic tradition is more rich and diverse. On this question, we're going to investigate in particular the Ismaili Shia tradition of thinking through the revelation of the Quran, which is connected to a larger cosmological vision. It's a really great chat with a distinguished professor, Khalil Andani, PhD from Harvard. We'll speak about his uh, dissertation, 800-page dissertation at Harvard, which deals with revelation in the Quran and in later Islamic tradition. Thank you so much for being here. Friends, please take a moment to subscribe to Exploring the Quran and the Bible and to like this video. Hello, Khalil Andani. Thank you so much for being with me on Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's great to be here uh, and uh, be a guest of uh, this uh, up and coming uh, show and, and good to see more established academics, you know, engaging, uh, engaging the public. Uh, I've been in this realm for some time uh, when it was not acceptable. Uh, but uh, it's good to see people like yourself, uh, you know, established scholars, you know, welcoming this engagement. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right. We were speaking just before we hit record about the uh, importance of engaging a wider public instead of publishing for a couple of hundred uh, sort of technical books that will not make it outside of the ivory tower. And I think actually your, your work in public scholarship uh, has been exemplary because as our viewers will, so, will soon find out, you've shown uh, the, um, the the ability to do extremely technical work, extremely lengthy technical work. And so you've established yourself within uh, the academy. and uh, But you've also shown that you can do both things. You can also engage with the wider public. So uh, yeah, friends, I'm going to start with a brief introduction of Dr. Andani, and uh, then we'll be speaking today about both revelation and the Quran generally within different currents of Islamic tradition, but also specifically about the, the Shia Ismaili tradition and what's distinctive about it, how it adds to the diversity of Islamic thought in regard to the Quran. So here's a brief introduction, everyone. Uh, Khalid Andani was an accountant before he was a professor. He originally began studying Arabic under Shabir Ali at the University of Toronto and then studied at the Harvard Divinity School, did an MTS in 2014, uh, and then went on to NELC, Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and Civilizations. Which one is it? I believe it's Civilizations. Unless okay, they've okay. Been Civilizations at, at Harvard as well. Uh, he writes, quote, I was planning to just specialize in Ismaili studies because that is how I entered academia, but over the PhD, my focus really broadened to the history of Islamic kalam and falsafa or philosophy, since Ismailis were engaging that. And I picked the topic of revelation and everyone that became a thesis, which is only 800 pages long. And uh, from there, he moved generally into Quranic studies, since you have to get to the original vision of revelation. Those are his words before studying its developments. Uh, he writes that his work has come full circle from Ismaili studies to Quranic studies and back again. His Harvard dissertation is entitled Revelation in Islam, Quranic, Sunni, and Shi Ismaili Perspectives. He has a number of other publications, either forthcoming or already published. I think you have an academia page, is that right? I do, yes. Yep. So you can find more of his writings there. Okay, so um, Khalil, I thought we would start by just getting to know a little bit the Ismailiya. Uh, so, I mean, those who are not familiar with um, the diversity of Islamic movements generally may have a vague idea that there are Sunni Muslims and Shi or Shia Muslims out there, uh, but may have never heard of the Isma Ismailiya or Ismaili Shia. So, what are I mean, where where would you start? What what are the basic essential things people should know about the Ismailis? Sure. So I, uh, we have to sort of back up a little bit and we have to go to the first 150 years after the the, the death of the prophet. Right. Uh, so we're now looking at the 700s. So contrary to what people think, um, there was no actually unified, you know, creedally unified or legally unified Muslim community during the 700s. Uh, there was not even a main body and then splinter groups. What you actually had is a plethora of different sections, you know, we could call them 
a, a plethora of communities of interpretation, mm -hmm. uh, which had different beliefs, uh, different uh, legal understandings, uh, different sources of what they deemed authoritative and different notions of leadership. Uh, and among uh, these early groups, so you have what you could call proto-Sunnis, you have the people who support the Umayyad Caliphs, uh, you have the Abbasid party, you have the Khawarij, uh, you have then a particular Shi'i group, which we could call the Imami Shia. And the Ismailis are a group that emerges from or out of the Imami Shia. The Imami Shia is a group that we know based on the latest research. The Imami Shia as a distinct ritual and creedal community existed in the early second century. Okay. Uh, and they were a community. Early second century, sorry, early to second but century, H Hijri, yeah. of course, Islamic. Hijri, century. correct. Hijri, yeah. So er, by by early second century Hijri, so we're looking at like the seven thirties, right? There is a distinct group of Muslims who we call the Imamis or the Imami Shia, and they hold a certain beliefs and legal ritual understandings uh, that segment them or distinguish them from others. Uh, what are those understandings? So the Imami Shia believe that the Prophet Muhammad was, of course, the last in a long line of messengers and prophets from God who brought divine guidance in particular modalities, such as the Quran, as well as the Sunnah. Uh, but the Imami Shia believe that actually before the Prophet Muhammad and after the Prophet Muhammad, uh, there has always been a channel of divine guidance on earth, namely one human being on earth who is an infallible, divinely inspired guide. And the Imami Shia refer to this figure as the either the Imam or they refer to this figure as Hujatullah, the proof or the guarantor of God. So the Imami Shia understanding of human history is that as long as there's been humans on earth, God has always intended humans to recognize God and recognize the obligations that God has placed on humans. But in this notion, humans left to their own devices will not be able to figure this out. So there's an argument that the Imami Shia gave that God has always established a human being who represents him, who conveys his guidance in an infallible manner to the people of the world. That person is called either the imam in the post-Muhammadan period. He's called the imam. And in a general sense, he's called the huja, the proof of God. So there's right. many sort of teachings in imami Shiism that say the earth will never be vacant of a proof of God who teaches people uh, God's guidance or who teaches people the truth from the falsehood. So the imami Shia believe that Prophet Muhammad, although he was a last messenger prophet, He's the last person to bring, you know, uh, a modality of divine guidance that it was what we call scriptural revelation. Right. Uh, Prophet Muhammad was not the last representative of God on earth. That function of representing God on earth and guiding people, interpreting revelation, contextualizing it to new situations, sometimes, you know, altering older rulings and replacing older divine rulings with more updated ones. That function, according to Imami Shia, had to continue after the Prophet. So that the Prophet Muhammad and the Imami Shia view, specifically appointed by divine command, mm -hmm. his cousin and, and son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, to be his successor, not as a new prophet, but to be the successor as the supreme spiritual leader, guide of the believer community. So to be that hujatullah, the proof of God, and imam of guidance on earth. It does so seem to have, answer your question, yeah. if I could just jump in for a second, just to, sort of an anecdotal comment that uh, sometimes my students, when I introduce to them the idea of prophets in Islam, they, they question the idea of the end of prophecy, right? So how could it be that God had this sort of providential concern for his creation up to the death of the prophet Muhammad? But not thereafter. Where, where was where was the guidance coming from? And I'm sure there are good Sunni sort of apologetical answers to that. But there's something uh, coherent about the Shia idea that no, it it didn't stop. It was different with the Imams, but it continued. 
Yes, and and this is a this type of argument, although it was formalized as an argument in the later period, you know, probably in the nine hundreds and thousands, it's 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 introduced as a formal argument, right, with premises and conclusion. But in the early period, in the teachings of the imams, who we'll just we'll talk about, uh, the argument is given in this raw form, like the right. earth cannot exist without an imam or a proof of God who teaches the people what is permissible and what is forbidden. And if this person was not present on earth, the world would just disintegrate. Like you have you have sayings like this. Um, there's even a tradition going back to Ali himself, uh, known as the discourse of Ali, Imam Ali to Kumail, which is circulated in both Sunni and Shi'i corpuses where Imam Ali says to Kumail, his disciple, uh, the, you know, along the lines of the earth will never be without someone who, who upholds the huja, the proof of God, either openly manifest or either you know, concealed in secrecy. So this seems to be somewhat of an old idea that, that you could probably trace back at least to the early second century of Islam, if not earlier. So the Imam Shia then recognized that you you have to sort of know who the imam of guidance is and the only way to know who that person is whom god has chosen is by the express indication of a prior imam of guidance so you'd look to the prophet and see did the who did the prophet point to so they believe the imam shia believe um and and non imam shia also believe this so you have zaidi shia who are a somewhat different group uh so all the Shia basically believe that the prophet designated Ali as that imam of guidance. Uh, and then there are some different understandings on what happens after Ali, but generally in the imami Shia view, Ali designated his sons, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, and then Al-Hussein before his death designated his son, Ali Zain al-Abidin, uh, for those viewers who may know, um, Imam Hussein and almost his entire male uh, family was massacred at Karbala, right, by uh, the Umayyads. But one, there was one son, like, who survived, who was at Karbala, Ali Zain al Abidin, who didn't participate in the battle. And, and from a certain perspective, it was, like, miraculous that this young person survived. And he went on to be the, the next imam of the early Shia. Uh, and then he appointed his son, Muhammad al-Bakir, as the next imam, uh, and Muhammad al-Bakir appointed his son Jafar al-Sadiq. Mm -hmm. So Muhammad al-Bakir and Jafar al-Sadiq are the ones, because they were they, they, they were not politically active, they were serving as scholars, um, and they had a wide following. And they're the ones who really, you could say, systematized this understanding that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, the earlier ones, they did claim leadership. There are letters of Imam Al Hussein even quoted in Tabari where he refers to himself as an imam of guidance and 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 the heir of the prophet and all this stuff. Imam Ali, there are statements attributed to him where he says uh, that he is the wasi, the executor of the prophet's will. But this systematic, more systematic understanding that I began with, you really find it in the teachings of Muhammad al Bakir and Jafar Sadiq, who are claiming to be these imams, these infallible imams. And therefore, there's now a group around them, which we call the Imami Shia, who recognize this leadership office that is transmitted by designation. Right. And right. it remains in the lineage of Al Hussein. Right, right. And then it's after Jafar that the division takes place, at least between Ismailiyah and the, the Imami or the Twelver Shia. Yeah, so what happens then is uh, Muhammad al-Bakir and Jafar al-Sadiq had articulated how this leadership works. So they talked about that that, that the imam is uh, protected from sins, masum. They talked about how the imam has inherited through a spiritual inheritance a sacred knowledge, ilm, all the way from the prophet. Therefore, the imam's interpretation of law and theology is safeguarded as always correct. There's a little, not full, but there's a little bit of overlap here with certain Catholic understandings of, of uh, papal infallibility, for example. Um, and therefore, the 
recognition of who the imam is can only be facilitated by the person whom the current imam appoints. So Muhammad al-Bakir explicitly appointed Jafar al-Sadiq. So almost all of his followers recognized Jafar al-Sadiq as their next imam after Muhammad al-Bakir died. Um, now, Jafar al-Sadiq and Muhammad al-Bakir are living in a time where there is a the Umayyads are ruling. And people don't know this. The Umayyad caliphs, interestingly, made very similar claims about themselves. Mm -hmm. They claim to be divinely appointed, mm -hmm. infallible, mm -hmm. divinely guided mm -hmm. representatives of God. Mm -hmm. Patricia Corona's Wait, book, written about this, yes. God Caliph talks about this. So Wait, this idea the, is not, this is not some, yes, yes. So this idea, this, what we today would call a Shi'i understanding of leadership is not some outlier in that period. Like it, it firmly belongs in that period. We shouldn't be surprised that the Shi'i Imams and the Umayyads are rival claimants to like the same, the same office basically. Right, right. Um, but what that meant is that the Umayyads and then later the Abbasids kept a close watch on these imams of the Husaynid line. You also had imams of the descendants of Imam al-Hassan who claimed imama through a different way, through like revolutionary activity. Mm -hmm. So this is a turbulent time. Now, this is where it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit spicy, if you will, right? So Imam Jafar Sadiq, uh, according to most extant sources that we have, sources, that is what I mean is what is reported in the books of the Twelver Shia, the early Twelver Shia, what is reported in the books of the Ismailis and even some Zaidi and, and, and Sunni sort of are, you know reports. Uh, according to most extant sources, Imam Jafar Sadiq had appointed as the next imam, as his successor, uh, his one of his eldest sons, Ismail, to be the next imam. Mm -hmm. This is at least, this idea that this appointment happened is something that almost every historian who's written on the matter, you know, has sort of also said. Uh, of course, today, if you ask non-Ismailis, like 12ers, they will now say that there was no such appointment. You know, people sort of made this up. But I, I would say, and, and I, something I might write on later, uh, if we look at the, the extant sources and apply certain criterions, historical criterion, we will be able to basically estimate with high probability that Imam Jafar had indeed appointed uh, Ismail as the next Imam. Uh, some of two of the earliest uh, heresiographies written by 12 or Shia scholars, uh, uh, Naubakti and Al-Kumi, actually say this in passing. Now, the same majority of sources also say that Ismail, subsequent to the appointment, passed away right. while his father was alive. Right. So then when Imam Jafar himself passed away, there was a confusion of sorts among his partisans on who is the next imam right so some groups at least two or three groups said well ismail was appointed uh and maybe he's not really dead he may have just been concealed away sent away by his father and the death was staged and and there are you know there's at least one group who believe that another group of of what we would call ismailis said whether Ismail is dead or whether he's alive, it doesn't matter. He was the appointed successor, and therefore the imama would continue in the lineage of Ismail. Imama right. doesn't jump from brother to brother. Right. Uh, so you have some groups like that, and they would we would call those the earliest Ismailis. So this is basically an adherence to the Ismaili lineage as a legitimate imam. But then you have all these other groups. So the bulk of Imam Jafar's followers, when Imam Jafar died, they followed Ismail's full brother, Abdullah, as the next imam. Mm -hmm. And then a smaller group followed a younger son named Musa al Qazim. Mm -hmm. Then Abdullah died very quickly, like within like a few months or something, mm -hmm. apparently without progeny. So the followers of Abdullah uh, then moved on to the next candidate, who was Musa al Qazim. So the bulk of the early Shia, or at least a good portion, followed the younger son, Musa as their next imam, while these a few other groups followed 
Ismail and Ismail's son, Muhammad bin Ismail. Muhammad bin Ismail. Mm -hmm. So now we have, I mean, there were more than two, but you could sort of say there are two major sort of responses to this, the Musawi followers and the Ismaili followers. So Khalil, I wonder if I could uh, jump in there because um, there's a lot more to say about the development of Ismailia, because as you note in your writings, um, there's two main traditions today. Uh, and maybe we can turn back to that later in this discussion or in a future discussion. Um, what I wanted to make sure we get to is the, the beginnings of distinctive ways of engaging with the Quran among the Ismailiyah. So when we see this division that takes place after Jafar, Jafar al-Sadiq uh, and Ismaili, Ismailiyah sort of historically diverge from the Twelver Shia, uh, when is it that we have sort of the classical Ismaili thinkers who develop distinctive ways of thinking about the Quran? Sure. So uh, that division happens in like 765, what I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, after that, you know, our sources are sort of not very clear on, on what, what, what everybody's doing. But by the second half of the 800s, the Ismailia are an organized dawa. Okay, meaning invitation or call or... Sorry. Yes, the Ismailis establish a dawa led by the descendants of Muhammad bin Ismail, who are the imams, uh, although they're not open, they're not publicly claiming imama at this time, but they have established a network of spiritual teachers or dais. Mm -hmm. uh, and their message has sort of two parts to it. One part of their message is to call people to recognize the imam, okay, as the legitimate leader. But the second part of the Ismaili Dawah message is an entire body of esoteric teachings. Right. Right. right, where the Quran and previous scriptures are being engaged, they're being interpreted uh, by, a, by a body of esoteric teachings. I don't mean like a haphazard set of comments on the Quran. I mean like an entire uh, theological cosmology, yes. right, that starts with certain notions of God, a hierarchy of intermediaries, created intermediaries that flow from God all the way to the material world, and the whole imamology, prophetology, what the Quran is, it's all situated within a much broader uh, theological cosmology. So you have one version of that in the er late 800s and the early 900s, but I would say in the mid 900s, uh, once a lot of the Neoplatonic material had been translated into Arabic, uh, Ismaili dies under the guidance of the Ismaili Imams, who by this time are the caliphs of the Fatimid Empire, the Ismaili dies under the Ismaili Imams' guidance, selectively appropriate Neoplatonic terminology, and they describe the entire worldview using these Neoplatonic terms like the universal intellect, the universal soul, and they situate concepts of God's word and God's scripture, Kitabullah, uh, within this worldview. So if you want, I can sort of try to give a a, a summary of, of, of that. I think we should Quranic. speak about that. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask specifically, or sort of anticipate a possible objection um, to this integration of Neoplatonism into uh, this uh, Muslim community's um, way of seeing God, the cosmos, and revelation. So... Um, I, th I mean, you, you sort of anticipated probably the, the the Ismaili perspective when you said under the guidance of the imam. But um, I mean, I could imagine people saying, well, I mean, this is not how it should work in Islam. Um, Neoplatonism was the heritage of classical Greek pagans and um, which uh, entered into Arabic thought among philosophers and others through the translation movement. Um, so, you know, by what right? would any Islamic group take this and integrate it into sort of the core central religious questions? You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, what would be what would be your response to a question like that? Yeah, I would say there's a there's a there's a twofold response um, from a historical perspective. The Quran is already engaging the different traditions of late antiquity. Uh, there's there's some even recent uh, work uh, by Juan Cole, 
uh, and by another scholar, I think his name is Descharno, uh, out of a... a Julian Descharno, yes. Descharno, yes. So but both of them have actually uh, shown to different degrees that the Quran uh, is already engaging with the Neoplatonic heritage. Mm -hmm. um, Juan Cole talked about how the, the notion of the one uh, in Neoplatonism is, is closely echoed by uh, Surat al-Ikhlas, for example, um, Descharno has talked about how certain Neoplatonic uh, notions of the Logoi uh, are are sort of mirrored by the Quranic discourse on Ayat Allah, mm. for example. Uh, and I, I believe there's even more. Uh, you know, um, in my own analysis of you know the the Quran through a historical critical reading, um, I have argued that. The Quran subscribes to a, a cosmic notion of divine writing of of Kitab Allah, uh, which functionally uh, looks a lot like a Neoplatonic uh, hypostasis, you know, just by a different name. Mm -hmm. uh, so, at a historical level, the Quran is not a text that is like cordoned off from everything. Right, right. Quite the opposite. The Quran is permeated with with so many late antique ideas which it's sort of re-articulating and you could say theologically it's purifying some of those ideas mm -hmm. uh and quranic uh, symbolism of of the pen the the kalam and the tablet and the kitab uh and r divine writing uh once you understand that in its original context right uh it's clearly engaging with you could say christian receptions of neoplatonism but the second argument i would give which is a more meta a theological argument would be go something like this. So let's say you accept the Quran as a revelation. Uh, so you would at minimum concede that the Quran uh, points its hearers to the ayat or signs of God, which it clearly says is in co the cosmos, right? So the Quran has to co always correspond to objective reality. Hmm. which is the cosmos and everything in it, including our own souls. Right. So then something like Neoplatonism is just a way that humans are articulating a conception of objective reality, hmm. right? So Neo the Neoplatonic worldview is a framework to articulate, to represent reality. The Quran is a revelation, and the Quran also represents that reality. Mm -hmm. And therefore, once you are at that point, if 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 the Quran is a legitimate revelation and the Quran reflects reality, and if the Neoplatonic worldview on its own terms is accurate, which I as a philosopher would argue it is, then it's entirely natural uh, to adopt the Neoplatonic language and situate the Quran uh, in that sense. Okay. Okay. That's very good. Now, um, be, maybe as a way of getting at what the cosmos look like from uh, Ismaili slash Neoplatonic view, um, can I ask what, I mean, if if a, maybe a Muslim viewer were to ask, so what's the advantage, I mean, what's the use or what's the advantage, what's the benefit of seeing things from a Neoplatonic perspective, that is the relationship between God and the cosmos, and in particular, in particular, the the question of revelation, like what 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 new or what different or what uh, what what sort of uh, questions or problems can be answered by this perspective? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, sure. So, uh, would I be able to screen share? I think you have to give a permission or something. Yeah, I can do that. Hold on, let me just give me a second. I'm just gonna share that that diagram uh, in that in the chapter. That okay. Let's see. Let's see if it works now. Okay, great. Uh, so let me do this. All right, you can see yes. my uh, PDF, right? Yes. Okay, so this is a diagram that I had included in, and I'm going to zoom in on it. I had included this in the chapter I published in the Routledge Companion to the Quran. So this, in a nutshell, what you can see here is, is like the Ismaili Neoplatonic uh, worldview. And so everyone can see. So this worldview 
has been argued by Ismaili thinkers and by other Neoplatonists. It has been argued on its own merits. It, it has not been, you know, argued on purely on, okay, the Imam said it. So, you know, okay. Accept okay. It. So there are philosophical arguments or cosmological arguments for this. So the first is you have God, which Ismailis often refer to as Al-Mubdi, the originator of all things, of all existence. And in this Neoplatonic understanding, which others share, God is absolutely transcendent, absolutely simple. So this is like divine simplicity, as some of the, the Catholic viewers might recognize. And there are, I'm not going to get into it, but there are cogent arguments on why divine simplicity is true. Uh, if it, if one denies divine simplicity, if one says there are real distinctions within God, then God ends up being composed of parts, metaphysical parts of some kind, right? This, of course, jives with the, the whole Quranic discourse on God. Uh, the Quran is very clear. God is absolutely one. God is Ahad. The Quran doesn't speak of God having parts in any sense. Uh, then what you have is... Uh, God is timeless, and therefore God's action, what God does, must also be eternal. God's act cannot emerge in time, because that would, in this argument, that would put God in time. So you have a timeless divine action, and that is what Ismailis call the Kalamala. Right. So now already we're getting into it, right? One of the biggest problems uh, debated by Muslims or in, the, in this time is, it, what is the speech of God? Is it words in Arabic or is it something transcendent? Is the Kalam Allah uncreated? Is it created? Is it eternal? Is it temporal? All this, every every position was for sale, right? So the Ismaili position is interesting. The Kalam Allah is not an uncreated attribute of God. So it's not something in God that eternally, uncreatedly sits there with God. The Kalam Allah is an act of God, but it's still an eternal act of God. Okay, And this sort of crossways the Mu'tazila and sort of Ashari positions, it sort of marries them in a way. Uh, so you have God's action, which is an, an act of creation, an act of origination, and that's eternal. And then you have the effect of the divine action, the first effect, which is the universal intellect over here. Uh, this universal intellect is what the tradition calls the pen. So you have all these hadiths. The first thing God created is the pen. Right. And then God told the pen, write down everything in creation. And then the pen follows. And then so basically, there's an initial act of creation that takes place prior to the physical creation. Uh, and that's what the pen hadiths are about. And that's what the universal intellect functions as. Okay. Uh, and of course, if there's a pen, there's a tablet. So that first level of intelligible creation uh, all the archetypes of everything are determined by god uh so where does this happen in a sense what's the locus of that that would be the universal soul which is mm -hmm. called the tablet okay so you have this process a uh, cosmological process and then it's the universal soul which has received the archetypes those archetypes by the way that is the divine writing that's what the Quran calls the Kitab, Kitab Allah, or Kitab Mubin. Or... So, for example, in Surah Al-Alaq, where we hear of God, Allah the Alam bil Qalam, an Ismaili interpretation would see it within the scheme. Or... Yeah, this is the, the Qalam, one who teaches the with a pen. Yes. Yeah, so all, all human knowledge, every human act of, of thought, of intellection, uh, is picking up uh, an effusion of knowledge from the universal intellect. Okay. This is sort of similar to certain Augustinian notions of knowledge as illumination, for example. Okay. Uh, the intellect here also functions, not theologically, but it sort of cosmologically functions as the logos uh, of, of Christian theology. Okay. So then the physical creation and the, the individual creations, like people, you know, souls like you and me and the world we live in, a form and matter, that is directly manifested out of the universal soul mm -hmm. or the tablet. So this is cosmology, and I'm going to zoom out now, and you can sort of break it down into different levels, but you this is a cosmology. So the idea is that revelation is a process that already mirrors the cosmological process. Okay, that's fair. If this is how everything came to be initially and, con and continually, right, the creation is happening right now, 
then revelation is a sub process already built into cosmology and all revelation is going to pass through the same levels mm -hmm. so now let's talk about what the quran is so the quran as an arabic recitation is not identical to the kalam allah that's not possible because at the kalam allah here there is no physical matter right there's no sound there's no language so the eternal kalam allah as a divine action transcends the arabic quran mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what is the arabic that, quran that, yes that is so that's sort of the uh the heart of the matter um, I would imagine when it comes to engaging with other traditions within uh, of, of other Muslim communities, right? Yeah. And and to be fair, just this top part here, and just what I just said, that the Arabic linguistic Quran is not identical to the Kalam Allah. Mm -hmm. This is something that in a qualified sense, Ash'aris and Maturidi Sunnis would get on board with too. When they talk about Kalam Allah, they also differentiate Kalam Allah, which yes. is an eternal divine attribute for yes. them, yes. from the Quran as, as sound and letters. Yes, yes, yes. And so, I mean, maybe to put things in a simple or perhaps simplistic way, it's important to know that many theological traditions, even within Sunni Islam, like the Ash'ariya, many Ash'ari thinkers uh, would say that God did not pronounce Arabic speech, um, created or uncreated, uh, but rather spoke in a sort of uh, spiritual nefs, sometimes called nefsi language, mm -hmm. which the angels interpret into Arabic speech, some or the angel Gabriel in particular. So that's true, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I mean, I think as we go further into this, Ismaili understanding of the revelation of the Quran, there is something distinctive about the role of the prophet, right? Yeah, so let's talk about that. So basically, since revelation recapitulates cosmology, we just to understand what revelation is. Because remember, what is revelation, right? Revelation is a process. It's not a thing, mm -hmm. right? Revelation is a process. It's a process of, of, of kashf, of disclosure, and of manifestation, right, of, of zuhur. So the revelation process, it follows and is really already part of the creative cosmological process. Uh, so in one sense, um, there is the divine word which is eternal is emanating down the cosmological hierarchy all the time you and i are receiving in a very minute sense a degree or share of kalam allah mm -hmm. this is what ismaili say ismaili say that everybody's rational faculty everybody's akal is what nasser khusro calls weak divine inspiration okay Okay. I think he calls it wahi zaif or okay. daif. Like daif. Yeah, we yes. so I mean, does this have practical consequences in promoting a culture of learning uh and philosophy in particular among among all the Ismailia? Yes, it does, definitely, right? Because there's this idea that like we each have in a limited way access to these higher realities through intellect, but we have to cultivate our intellect and cleanse our soul through spiritual practices and so on to greater to make that connection greater so every human has this every human is receiving glimmers of this light from mm -hmm. the top yeah. but uh not all humans are created equal in that so going back to what i said earlier the shia made this argument that there must be this person in the human species mm -hmm who can be an infallible divine guide so the cosmological perspective would say well this is already built into creation the creation happens in a certain way that in the human species there's going to be at least one person uh whose soul is optimally receptive to these emanations mm -hmm. of the divine speech mm -hmm. so that person at specific times that person comes along, which we call a Nothic, a speaker prophet. So now we're over here. And a speaker prophet receives the greatest amount, the greatest share of emanated divine speech that a human can receive. And furthermore, what the speaker prophet does is he receives it spiritually. Yes. Okay. So Wahi is not verbal, according to Ismaili teachings. It's not sounds. It's not words. It's not linguistic. 
right? It's purely spiritual, uh, ruhani or akli. Uh, and the soul of the prophet is granted this reception because the prophet's own innate capacity uh, is what facilitates that reception. So it's not a case where God is sort of looking down, points at someone and utters something in time and, and then poof, you know, the person gets it. And it's not a case where God is speaking to an angel, go tell this guy this, and then the angel flies. This is rejected. This understanding is seen as like a very children's understanding okay. of the matter. Okay. So what's going on here is there's a continuous flow of the divine speech through the universal intellect, through the universal soul, through other spiritual intermediaries. Uh, sometimes they're called Jadfath and Kayal. They correspond to what we call the archangels. Okay. So there's a continuous flow, and whoever has the capacity to receive that flow, primarily the prophet, they receive it. And then what the prophet does, and this is a distinctive Ismaili teaching, the prophet, as he looks at his own people, as he lives in his own time, as he is embedded in his own culture, the prophet appropriates pre-existing language, idiom, symbols, maybe stories, and he clothes that spiritual wahi, that spiritual divine inspiration, he clothes it with language. Right, right. And therefore, the Arabic Quran, as a Quran, as an Arabic recitation that is rich and what many Muslims will consider miraculously inimitable, in the Ismaili view, that Quranic recitation as words is the divinely inspired product of the Prophet's soul. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So, in your in your introduction to your dissertation, you have some quotations of a number of uh, academics who all use the word or well, either they use the word verbatim or something like it, right? So, this seems to be why. The, the interesting thing about this list of quotations is they're not all Muslim. Some are non-Muslim academic observers of Islam and the Quran. So, for example, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, I think it's from the study Quran writes the Quran is for Muslims the verbatim word of God revealed during the 23 period of the prophetic mission of the Prophet Muhammad through the agency of the Archangel Gabriel. Ferdid Ishaq writes, for Muslims, the Quran is the literal word of God. Uh, Abdul Halim writes, God speaks directly in the Quran. Uh, Gerhard Bevering, uh, with whom I studied at Yale, writes, God is the speaker of the Quran and Muhammad is its recipient. The Quran itself is considered the verbatim word of God. Uh, and I mean, your point is uh, this uh, this portrayal uh, limits the diversity of Islamic thought about the Quran and the process of revelation. Um, and we have a distinctive model with Ismailiyah in which uh, the prophet is the one who uh, who who articulates the Arabic speech of the Quran. I mean, in a way, it gives the prophet a more central role and also uh, almost elevates his personal qualities, uh, intellectual and ethical, I imagine, um, you could confirm that, in a way that um, almost surpasses other ways of thinking about the process of revelation. Yeah, so definitely the quotes you read, uh, the issue I had with them is, A, they're, they're sort of overly, they're just simplistic, right? Mm -hmm. they, they lack all the theological nuance that Muslims for centuries have have been stressing, including Sunni Muslim uh, Kalam theologians as well. And uh, those quotes, they also uh, claim or they purport to represent what Muslims as a whole have believed and have always believed. And that's not true. So if we took those quotes at face value, that as a typical person would understand them who doesn't know any of this, those quotes really only describe accurately the Hanbali view of the Quran. It's the Hanbali view. Not even the Ashari view. No, no. The Ashari and the um, Maturidis would qualify some a lot of this stuff. So right, they would say, right. well, the Quran is Kalam Allah, if you mean Kalam Lafzi. <laughs> But it's not the same. It's not the same as the kalam uh, nafsi. Yes. So I, I actually pre and and I want and, and and sometimes there's a double talk. Like like let's just admit it. Sometimes 
the the scholarly intelligentsia of even Asheris and Mataridis will equivocate in their language. Like sometimes they'll say something to the lay people, but then among their own discussions, they'll say something different. So I quoted uh, uh, an Ashari uh, Azhari scholar, Muhammad Al-Fadali, in my introduction in that thesis. It, by the way, it was really hard to find that text. I could only find translations. Um, so I tracked it down, and he actually said very clearly that he says the noble utterances, right? The I think he says the uh, alfad alfaz uh, sharifa, like the noble utterances, namely the actual words of the Quran. He's like the noble utterances are, are not the kalam Allah, and, and he says many people have made a mistake in confuse. I'm paraphrasing him, but I have the quote in the chapter. Many people have just made the mistake of just conflating the eternal uncreated speech of God with the noble utterances, the actual, you know, sonic words uh, of the Quran. So these quotes that you read, although I respect all those scholars and I've learned a lot from them, they don't even capture the Ashuri and the Maturidi views. They only speak for the Hanbali view, which is fine. Like, yeah, the Hanbalis do believe the words of the Quran are the literal uncreated speech of God. But this is not representative of historical, even Sunni Islam. And for groups like the Ismailis, uh, who have a completely different view, like it just doesn't count uh, it, as far as these quotes are, are concerned. So that's why I began my work with them. Right, right. So I, I want to ask in the time we have left a little bit about your engagement with other contemporary uh, academic scholars or maybe uh, Muslim thinker activists who are uh, interested in these questions from from non-ismaili perspectives so uh either imami shia or sunnis of various types or whatever it might be um i mean do you find that there's openness to learning lessons from the Ismailia or at least appreciating the coherence of their thought is there pushback that no um this is somehow a danger to uh, I don't know, Islamic apologetics, or it maybe crosses the line between orthodoxy and heresy, or heterodoxy. Yeah, could could you speak to that? Sure. So, um, one, one thing you said earlier, right, that this view of the Quran, the Ismaili view of the Quran of Revelation elevates the prophet. Um, it does. It does elevate the prophet. Uh, it elevates the prophet's agency, right? It gives the prophet real creative agency in in the sort of verbal contents of the Quran. And um, I personally think that this is actually a very strong theology uh, that the Ismailis have. Now I'm biased because I'm Ismaili myself, but I'm allowed to be. Uh, but to be fair, like the alternative to this is what I call like fax machine revelation theology right where the prophet is reduced to like a, a, an answering machine that just like repeats what somebody else says there's also or, i think voice memo app to be yeah yeah voice memo app whatever you want to call it right there's also i believe there are metaphysical problems uh that arise on the the more traditional views so like if like what metaphysics is going to support verbal sort of auditory notions of revelation uh you i'm not saying you can't have it but like you need like a robust metaphysics to sort of make that work and and I, it, it really hasn't been presented whereas when the ismailis are crafting their theory of revelation they have like a whole metaphysics uh to back this entire thing so it makes sense but this leads to your other question so what has the reception been like so I, among uh, academics and academically literate muslims the usual thing is disbelief, uh, not in the bad sense of disbelief in that, no, I never heard this. Like, as far as I know, somebody says all Muslims believe the same thing about Revelation, you know, and people often don't believe me. And then I say, well, I wrote 800 pages on it. You know, why don't you, why don't you read it? And, and one person literally, uh, I'm not going to name him because he seems like a nice chap, but he, uh, I've made like a few arguments in my work, right? So before engaging the reception of Muslims, of what the Muslims think revelation is, Ismail is included, I did my own study of the Quranic notion of revelation mm. using the methods that you, you know, the people in, in, in our field use. Right. And I came up with 
what I think is the Quran's notion of revelation. And I don't even think the Quran actually teaches this auditory ver verbal inspiration to begin with. I think Quranic Wahi is actually a nonverbal type of inspiration or prompting. Um, and I gave... One, one could already that, point out that Wahi is given to uh, the earth and to the bees and to non non-human uh, yes, and, and in pre-Islamic poetry, the, the wahi is a, is a non-verbal, like, coded communication. It's not explicit Arabic words of any kind. So I gave sort of uh, what I would call, like, literary, um, historical, critical arguments for what I think the Quran is saying about revelation, which, which is also about what kitab really means, and so on. And the reception to that among some people who don't even read the dissertation is like no, this is this can't be right. So I had one guy who who claimed to uh, who claimed to refute my entire dissertation on Twitter, but then said I don't need to read the dissertation. I'm just going by by what he tweets. So okay, so that's one thing. Um, but I do I have noticed, and and you've had a prior guest who made the point. So, you know, we now have a whole laundry list of examples of how the Quranic text, the content of the Quran. Uh, is intertextually engaging Jewish Christian mm -hmm. writings, mm -hmm. right? Maybe even more than that. And now we can add Neoplatonic to, to the mix. Like the Quran is intertextually engaging writings that are um, circulating in Arabia and in the late antique milieu. And it's it's appropriating certain ideas and retelling and it's responding, you know, to certain polemics and counter polemics. So now what are we going to do with that? Right? Uh, are we going to stick to this is like God somehow, a God who we believe is timeless is now like speaking in time? It, it, does, that's not going to work anymore. Right? So sometimes I found that Muslims who are sensitive to these developments, when you share with them that you have these other theories of revelation, whether it's Ismaili or whether it's Ibn Sina, yeah. some people can find it liberating. Them. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like, like you, right. you can actually now, like, I would say that someone who holds an Ismaili-ish theory of re Quranic revelation, it's way easier to 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 be a Quranic studies academic, because mm -hmm. when when I read your work, or when I read someone else's work on how the Quran is engaging with some text, right, or appropriating a story that may itself not be historical and retelling it, I don't feel threatened at all. To me. It's actually telling me about the genius, the, the, the genius intellect of the prophet, mm -hmm. because this is what the Ismailis and certain uh, Avicennan philosophers believe, that is the prophet's intellect has agency in the content of what we call what becomes the Quran. Mm -hmm. So for us, so you, um, you make the distinction just to maybe restate something we've we've spoken about already of the Quran as itself as speech of God, as Kalam Allah but also the word of the messenger of God. Yeah, so what that's saying is that the the Quran, the reality of the Quran is layered. So mm -hmm. the deepest layer that is being manifested through the words of the Quran, the deepest layer is the eternal divine act of creation, which is the speech of God, which is mm -hmm. which is happening right now. But, but, but everything also manifests the speech of God, not only the Quran, mm -hmm. but the Quran... Uh, at its um, more zahiri layers. Okay, so the right. exoteric. The yeah, the exoteric, exoteric layers of the Quran, which is the wording, the phraseology, the idiom, the the symbolism, uh, the the apparent levels of meaning of the Quran. So the contextual meaning of the Quran, uh, you know, what the Quran is saying in its own time, all of that uh, has been determined proximately by the prophet's intellect. So the prophet chose to express uh, this higher levels of reality in those words and those phrases. So when I read Quranic studies scholarship about, oh, the Quranic appropriation of the Alexander legend or the sleeper story or or the the you talked about this in your book, how the, the episode of bowing angels bowing before Adam. Mm -hmm. This is already in Christian literature and, and rabbinic literature, and the Quran has appropriated that and has changed it around a little bit, right? So to me, this is just more example of the, the literary uh, genius of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and and it, it's entirely what our model would expect. 
we would expect this, right? This is like an expected value in a sense. And I think this can help other Muslims uh, come to terms with what the scholarship is finding. Now, unfortunately, what happens is that the, the, the culture on Twitter is very polemical and it's not interested in giving things a fair shot. So I have like a 15 minute video where I explain uh, this Ismaili understanding of what the Quran is. Uh, and I explain how Wahi is nonverbal. It is nur, it's light. This is what an Ismaili Imam said. So the Ismaili Imam Al Muiz, he said, the, God sent the Prophet a light, nur, you know, which is not, which is beyond sounds and letters. And the Prophet received that light in his soul. And the Prophet saw all these people around him and, and they couldn't receive that light in its original form. So the Prophet coined expressions and words. And he constructed a recitation and he, he sort of encased that light within the recitation, right? And that he recited it. So now people hear the recitation through their ears. And by, by internalizing the recitation, which is physical, people can get some access to that original light. Yes. That's what revelation is. And then the, the, the last part said, therefore, the Quran is the Kalam Allah in terms of that light mm -hmm. and the goal, the words of the messenger of Allah. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, so therefore the Quran is not the verbatim speech of Allah. It's the divinely inspired speech of the prophet. And then some people took like just the part where I said, it's not the verbatim speech of Allah. They just took that. They put it on Twitter. Well, and welcome people to Twitter. Like, <laughs> yeah. And people like Shadi al Masri uh, retweet it and they're like, oh, look, this is Kufur and this guy doesn't even believe in the Quran and why does he call himself a Muslim? So we have these sort of one upmanship cultures on social media, on Twitter, on YouTube. Uh, so sometimes the reception is like that. And I actually think that now, of course, I came out right in response to that. I called everybody out on bad editing, and I just tweeted the entire video that this was excerpted right. from. And like, my policy is that actually, and I believe, I believe you share this, that we academics um, should try as far as we can in, in good ethics to participate in these public realms. Right. Um I'm not a polemicist. Uh, anyone can read my work. You, I, I'm not a polemicist, but I do believe in counter polemics. Mm. Okay, so and I've done this. Like somebody once tweeted a silly article about Judaism, and 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 I I counter polemic on that. Okay. Uh, when people po do polemics against Islam or Ismailis mm -hmm. or whoever, if I feel qualified, I engage in counter polemics. And what that means is often. If somebody makes an argument against another point of view, uh, and I I perceive that they're applying a double standard, I will respond back and I say, okay, let's apply the standard that you're imposing on this group. Let's just apply it to your beliefs, to your own tradition. Right? See what we get, right? Like let's apply. So some Muslims, um, I'm not going to name them, but some Muslims have almost made a business out of attacking the Trinity. Mm -hmm. right the christian trinity as logically incoherent and metaphysically incoherent mm -hmm. now that's fine but then those people who tend to just attack 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 they sometimes they seem to be the peddlers of very problematic right more anthropomorphic salafi theologies right right so if you were to apply your trinitarian your your critique of the trinity mm -hmm. to sell the you know you have the logical problem of the trinity right, right. and maybe it's valid but there's also the logical problem of the Salafi, which right. I coined, you know. Um, so I just I clap I, I clap back and and I think that's fair game, right? As long as we apply the same standards to our own views uh, and other views. And I see a lot of one-sided stuff. So I have engaged in that. Um, and some of your viewers may know I, I debated um, you know, Jake the the so-called muslim metaphysician it was basically a smiley neoplatonic theology versus salafi theology and you know i believe the viewers can decide which stands on its own merits well Khalid, thank you so much uh i think we will end um round one there uh i would love to have you back to go deeper into both revelation inside of the quran so the quran's own vision of of divine revelation a communication to prophets, but also to creation, and um, and in addition to speak more about the Ismaili 
uh, tradition. Um, I sort of cut you off. I hope you're not upset at me when you were uh, giving us um, information and insight on the historical development of the movement. So there's a lot more to speak about. But for now, thank you so much. Um, last question, though. Uh, how would people stay in touch with your uh, work? Is there anything uh, you'd like to promote that's coming out uh, soon? Um, yeah, what would you say about that? Oh, I mean, my academia page tends to be updated. My Twitter is is active. Um, I'm also on Clubhouse. If you ever want to have conversations with me, uh, sort of very um, impromptu conversations, I'm on Clubhouse. So there's a bunch of stuff I've so that's come out this year. Um, my latest work is about is is on the philosophy of religion. So I'm engaging in adjacent fields, sort of engaging in debates with respectful debates that is with christian philosophers and and others about metaphysics and stuff like that and uh, trying to show that this neoplatonic worldview can stand even on its own philosophical uh merits so that's some of my latest stuff and it, i do it because it's fun it's I, I don't think i get credit for it among our field but <laughs> i do that because it's fun so but uh, it's been very nice to uh, be with you and um, yeah, we should we should get together again. There's sort of a, there's a lot to talk about, uh, you know, even one time, maybe we should discuss um, the, the crucifixion and the Quran, uh, which you've written about, because the Ismailis have an entire tradition of affirming the crucifixion. We which should speak about that. There's also a tradition of, I believe, various Ismaili thinkers who have engaged seriously with the Bible. Uh, so that's something else I'd love to speak about. Um, yeah, but for now, yeah, thank you so much, Khalid. Thank you for being here. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars and um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos, starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.